Matthew chapter 4. That's where we're going this morning, verse 13. The next step after your encounter. The next step after your encounter. I believe this message is right on target with God being in the house today and moving the way He's doing. And, and even with what was said about going from glory to glory, the next step after the encounter. What do you do after you've had an encounter with Jesus? Amen? What do you do? Matthew chapter 4 and verse 13 says, Jesus leaving Nazareth, He came and dwelled in Capernaum, which is upon the sea of sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtalim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat and darkness saw a great light. I'm glad that I've seen a great light. Anybody else today? And to them which sat in region and shadow of death, life has sprung up. That's what happens when you have an encounter with Jesus. Amen? From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father. And they were mending nets, and he called to them. And they, what? Immediately left the ship and their father, father and did what? They followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Get ready, that's what God's trying to do here this morning. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with different diseases and torments, and those which were, were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, from Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Lord Jesus, we thank you today that God, where we're sitting and standing, already people are having an encounter with you. God, you're talking to people's heart. You're speaking into our lives this morning. God, you're doing your best to bring us into a place that you can take us to another level, that you can take us beyond that initial encounter. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word that never changes, never it will return void, but accomplish what you desire. And today, God, we thank you for the anointing that's on this word, already inspired. Now, God, thank you for anointing me to preach, anoint our ears to hear and accomplish what you desire. God, you've started something this morning. Continue, we pray, through the moving and flowing of your spirit and through your word in Jesus' name. And we thank you. And everybody said, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. The next step after your encounter, the next step after your encounter, there are seven words I want you to remember in Matthew chapter 4. You'll find those words in verse 20. But you'll also find those words on the front cover of your bulletin. They left their nets and followed Jesus. Sometimes we just want to be in the bless me club. We want all the blessing we can get. But there's a time when we've got to leave our nets and we've got to follow him and do something for God. Can you say amen this morning? They left their nets and followed him. Matter of fact, these seven words on this bulletin has really inspired the message for this morning. Our speaker last night, Brother Leonard, did an awesome job and really connected with the message that we have this morning. Jerry Spivey is going to be here tonight at 6 o'clock, pastor from, uh, from uh, Whiteville, great preacher. And it's going to be great again tonight. And I know God's going to inspire. But these seven words inspired the message this morning. They left their nets and followed him. Why? Why would they leave their net? Why would they leave working with their family and their father and begin to follow him when Jesus just walked by and said, follow me? Why would anybody do such a thing? Simon Peter, Andrew and James, John, they were all fishermen. Brother James, this is a good message for you today. Amen, fishermen. They were men of ability and responsibility. These fishermen were doing 
what was necessary to survive and necessary to provide for their families. The scripture tells us in Luke 5.10 that these four men were in partnership together. That means they knew each other, they worked together, and they talked among themselves. They were not strangers. Most commentaries also tell us that these men were men of means. That means these four fishermen were not poor. They were men of means. My Men of means. How many of you know God calls people with money just like He calls the poor? Amen. You don't have to be a person of money and influence to be saved, and you don't have to be poor to be saved. God deals with us all, doesn't He? Hallelujah. Most commentaries tell us also, it's believed that James and John were cousins of Jesus. It's believed that their mother was a sister to Mary, the mother of Jesus. When the word said they left their nets and followed him, they were not following someone they knew nothing about. It's important that we get that this morning. Though we have all this information and though we have all this history, none of these things are the reasons they followed Jesus. It wasn't because he was their cousin. None of those reasons are the reasons they followed Jesus. The reason they followed Jesus as he walked by and, and they left their nets and followed him when he said, come follow me. The reason they left Jesus was because they already had a life-changing encounter with Jesus before then. Now I got a feeling there's at least two or three in this house and maybe more that have had, has had a life-changing experience with Jesus. Is there anybody here that has had that? You know, without a doubt, you've missed the Lord and your life has never been the same. Well, they'd already had a life-changing encounter with Him. Matter of fact, in John chapter 1, John the Baptist talked about his experience with God and with Jesus when he had baptized Jesus in water. John 1, he, John said, I know Jesus is the Son of God. Andrew and another, the Bible says, Andrew and another disciple was there and heard it. They heard what John said. When John the Baptist looked at Jesus after his baptism in water, and he made the statement, Behold, what? The Lamb of God. The Word tells us Andrew and the other disciple heard it at Jesus' baptism. Then Andrew went and told Simon, his brother, he had met Jesus, the Messiah. Andrew went, sought out his brother Simon, and brought him to meet Jesus. All this happened before Jesus said, come and follow me. All this had already taken place. And if you look in John chapter 1 and verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus, speaking of Simon Peter, and when Jesus beheld him, he said... Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is interpretation, a stone or a rock. Now I want you to think about, what, and this, again, this is before he said, come and follow me. The first time Peter met Jesus, Jesus said to him, you are Simon. I know who you are. You are Simon, the son of Jonah, but your name is going to be Peter or stone or rock. Peter's first encounter with Jesus changed his life. He was changed while, even while he, before Jesus met him when he was working on the nets with his family. His first encounter with Jesus let him know he would never be the same. His name was Simon. Jesus said, your name is going to be Rock. Don't you know after that first encounter with Jesus, after his baptism, don't you know every day Peter was wondering, what in the world does that mean to me? What does that mean for me? Jesus, the first time I meet him, he knows who I am. He called me by name, but he gave me another name. How many of you know, when you have your first encounter with Jesus and you come into the kingdom of God, he gives you a brand new name. 
you don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to him. He's given you a brand new name. Christian means Christ-like. Do you also know there's a name going to be written on your forehead? There's going to be a name given to you in heaven, and only you will know, and he will know. How many of you know you have a brand new name if you've had that salvation encounter with Jesus? How can you forget it when you meet the Lord? So here's Peter mending his nets. Here's Peter working on the boat. And don't you know why he's working? Rock, 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 stone. Lord, what does it mean? What does it mean? He was given a new name. Hallelujah. So point number one, the four fishermen had already met Jesus. If you read the scripture in Matthew chapter 4, it almost sounds like they didn't know him. He just walked by and said, come on. How many people are going to do that? See, they already knew him. They already had an encounter with him. Second thing, their first encounter with Jesus had already changed their lives. Now, nobody, no one can meet the Lord and Jesus speak to them about their life and not be changed in some way. There may be people that visit our churches and even visit here. And God deals with them about their life, about their sin, about needing to change. And they may leave here just like they came. But they will never forget that they met Jesus here. Are you hearing me today? Whether listening to a radio, in a church service, watching Christian TV, or a friend talking to you about Jesus... Once you begin to realize that you need to change your way of living as a result of God speaking to you, that will never get away from you. You will never be able to get away from that encounter with Jesus. Some people may wait 30 years to come to Jesus after Him speaking and dealing with their heart, but they remember that first encounter and they'll never be able to forget it. And if it takes them 30 years, thank God for His grace that allowed them the time and He kept speaking and bringing back to his remem their remembrance that encounter with Him. I'm going to be glad God didn't forget you. He won't forget your loved ones. Don't you give up on your children. Don't you give up on your family. Don't you give up on your friend. Don't you give up on your church when you've been praying for God to move and send revival. Listen, revival's in the house last night. Revival's in the house today. Revival's in the house tonight. Revival will be in the house Wednesday. Revival's going to be Monday through Sunday. Listen, we are in a place today where God is moving by His Spirit. It's time for some fresh encounters with Jesus. Come on, give Him a hand if you believe that today. Hallelujah. You'll never be able to forget. You can't have God deal with, deal with your heart and forget it. Can you? You'll either walk away or get mad or get right with God and be glad. <laughs> Hallelujah. This message really picks up in verse 13 following the message last week. Because in Luke 4, when Jesus opened the book of Isaiah and he began to read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he began to tell why he came and who he was. He was in his hometown. And when Jesus sat down and they started thinking, who does he think he is? This is Joseph's son. We've known him for 30 years. We saw him play in the streets. We saw him grow up here. Who is he to say that it's he, that he's the Messiah? But the second thing that bothered those people in Luke chapter 4 was when Jesus started talking about how he blesses the Gentiles. Now that really got that Jewish crowd in Nazareth. In, in, in Nazareth. They didn't like that at all. You know what they wanted from Jesus in Luke chapter 4? They wanted Jesus to do some kind of miracle so they could say he was who he said he was. I want you to think about that. Now we see, as Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, matter of fact, he left that crowd. Matter of fact, Jesus never does a miracle on a dare. Hey, I hear you're Pentecostal. 
I hear they speak in tongues at your church. Is that right? Yeah. Are you Pentecostal? Are you full of the Holy Ghost? Yeah. Then speak in tongues for me. Don't you dare speak in tongues on a dare. Once you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking tongues, you can speak in tongues anytime you want to. Drive in a car, in a prayer closet, in the bathroom if you want to. But don't you dare speak in tongues for somebody on a dare. Because even if you do, they still won't believe. And if Jesus had worked miracles for those people in Luke chapter 4, they still would not believe. And Jesus left Nazareth and he ended up going to Capernaum where our scripture picked up in Matthew chapter 4. Now in Matthew 4, as Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he calls out to the four fishermen and says, Come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they left. They left their nets and followed Jesus. I'm not telling you to quit your job today. We need your tithe. <laughs> now, I'm not telling you to quit your job because, amen, we do need your tithe, but that's not why. Okay. Now, don't you go quit your job, and don't you go around telling people I'm after your money. All right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Number three. The next step after your encounter with Jesus is to follow Him. A lot of people have encounters with Jesus, but they never follow. Am I telling you the truth this morning? This was Jesus calling them to be his disciples. This wasn't the call for them to be an apostle. This was his call for them to be disciples. A disciple is a learner. A disciple is what? A learner. Anybody learning anything as you walk with the Lord? Anybody need to learn some more? A disciple is a learner. A disciple follows the teachings of the one he is following. Says he's following. The word disciple is where we get our word discipline. Just think, if we as Christians really disciplined ourselves, the church would already be full. Think about that one. Christians read, listen, Watch and learn from Jesus. He's the best example, the best teacher they'll ever be. They follow or do what he has said for them to do. They discipline themselves and determine to please the Lord. After that encounter with Jesus where you come into the kingdom and you accept his salvation, the next step is to follow Jesus. Listen, watch, learn, and do. Listen, watch, learn, and do. So Jesus took these four men. They left their nets. They began to follow. Then Jesus took them immediately into training. They didn't have to wait six months to be trained. He took them immediately into training. How many of you know our time is running out? Jesus is coming soon, and he wants us to get some training under our belt, get his word under our belt, get his spirit in our heart so we can do something for him before he comes and help bring people into the kingdom of God. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 22, 4 and 22, here he is. They just started following him. They just began to follow Jesus and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. The gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of disease and sickness, all manner of disease among the people. His fame went throughout Syria and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with different diseases and torments and those who were possessed with devils and those who were lunatic. I don't know if there's any of those here or not. And those that had the palsy, he healed them. <laughs> he healed them. They left their nets and he started preaching. They left their nets and he started teaching. 
They left their nets and he started doing miracles. Didn't he? He started doing miracles. Hallelujah. Immediately they left and immediately they heard Jesus teach. They heard him preach with great authority. Immediately. Immediately they saw healings and miracles and demons cast out of those who had been bound. Now I want you to think how these four fishermen must have felt. They're used to catching fish. They're used to being out on the ocean or out on the sea. They went from mending nets and catching fish out on the quiet sea of Galilee into the hustle and bustle of the miraculous. I wonder if any of them thought about running when they saw demons come out of people. <laughs> I wonder how many would get up and get out of this service if right now a demon started acting up and we cast it out. How many of you would run so you wouldn't get a demon in you? you if you're a believer and you follow in Christ, you don't have to worry about it. Now I want you to picture what's happening with these fish. This is all new to them. There might be some in the service today and there might be some watching by internet today that are not used to a service like we've been having today. But I want you to know that doesn't matter. What matters is the Spirit of the Lord is in the house and the anointing is here and God is moving because He cares about each and every one that's watching, listening, seeing in this place or by internet today. Bye. Talk about shock therapy. How many of you had shock therapy the first time you went to a Pentecostal church? I knew, <laughs> scared me to death. I was going to a little Baptist church out in the country. I went down to the altar to get saved one time at this little Baptist church. God was really speaking to me as an eight, nine, ten year old. And all they did was talk to me about joining the church and never led me to Jesus. At 12 years old, I went with my uncle to visit the Assembly of God Church in the mountains. Whew. I'd never seen people act like that before. <laughs> people clapping, shouting, singing, dancing, teenagers around the front just having a hoedown. But God got hold of my heart. And at age 12, I gave my life to Jesus. And right after that, baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and not long after, called to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear God. I had shock therapy too. Like some of you. Peaches, you didn't know what you were getting into, did you? <laughs> Glad you didn't. <laughs> but you know, Jesus kept adding disciples until he had 12 who were close to him. Now, how many of you know God wants you close to him? In the beginning, he had 12 that were close to him. And if you go to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles at this time, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not but rather go to the lost house of the sheep of Israel. Their first commissioning was to their own. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Boy, I'd almost like to be in there when the first dead person came to life, wouldn't you? We'd be picking people up everywhere, wouldn't we? <laughs> The twelve Jesus first sent to Israel. They were doing what they had seen and heard Jesus do. Weren't they? They were doing what they had seen and heard Jesus do. And what happened as they followed Him, they began to sharpen their focus. They began to see clearly the things of God. That's what our skit this morning was going to be about. They began to see clearly how God worked and spoke and moved. If you don't get in, you'll never know how He works. You'll be afraid of what you see and what you hear until after you get in. Come on. Now remember, they went from their encounter with Jesus to following Him. 
They listened, watched, and learned, and now they were doing what Jesus had done. Now, I want you to write this down. If you have a pen and paper, it's a little bit lengthy, but I believe it's from the Lord. In order to refocus and shift priorities so we can put those things that are important to God first, we must move beyond our first encounter with Jesus. It's on the screen. In order to refocus and shift priorities so we can put those things that are important to God first. Say first with me. First. We talk like we put them first and we come to church once a week. We talk like we put them first but we don't tithe and give. Come on. We talk like we put him first, but we're not praying for anybody to be saved or laying hands on the sick for them to be healed. To be first, we must move from our first encounter with Jesus. Babies stay in the cradle. Followers get up and walk. Shout me down, say, oh me, or come slap me or something. Don't come slap me, don't come slap me. The babies stay in the cradle. Followers get up and walk. Jesus said, follow me. I tell you, I'm a long way from being a baby and I don't want to go back there. And I've not arrived yet, but I'm on my way to becoming everything God wants me to be and doing everything He wants me to do. How about you? And I believe in this place, there's a lot of people that love God are ready to take the next step in following Him. Followers don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. Can you see what's happening here with these disciples? Jesus preached repentance. Then he demonstrated the power of God. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. The disciples were now preaching repentance. Where'd they learn that? They watched him. They watched him. They were telling others about the kingdom of God. Through, through them, people were being healed and freed and brought into the kingdom of God. It wasn't just Jesus doing it anymore. It was them doing it. Amen. There was only one Peter, but everybody can be a follower. There's only one D.A. Leonard that preached last night, and Jerry Spivey coming, one Leo Bracken, one Jason Powell, one Larry Dolphinball, but everybody can be a follower of Jesus. Don't mimic me. Don't copy me, copy him. Amen, copy him. As they followed and did what Jesus said to do, they became what? Fishers of men. It didn't just happen. It was a process. They started following. They didn't know what they were getting into either. Did they? Just like some of you didn't know what you were getting into when you started coming here. But now you're glad you're here. Some said, I'm not going back to that church and you're still here. You know why? It's a God thing. Because deep inside there's some spiritual hunger there. And you may not be where you want to be yet in the Lord, but there's a, a spiritual hunger there. And God keeps tugging at that. And you keep coming back because you know there's more. Because you know there's more. Dear Lord, because of their walk with God, people were coming to Jesus. Because of our walk with God, people are going to come to Jesus. It's not all going to happen in here, but a lot of the preparation happens in here. Now I want you to notice what Jesus said to his disciples at a time, at a time when they were find, finding it hard to believe that he was alive from the dead. Remember, they'd seen him crucified. They saw him die. And even for Jesus to be right there talking to him after he came back from the dead, it was just hard to believe. Have you ever had anything happen and you knew it was real, you knew it was happening, and maybe it's even a good thing, but you, just, but it just don't seem real? Come on, raise your hand. You ever had anything too good to be true? You ever had anything too bad to be true? So he speaks to the disciples at a time they just... I know he told us, and I know he's, he's sitting right here. 
But they still wrestled in their mind and in their thoughts and their thinking about Jesus being alive from the dead. And in Mark chapter 16, listen to what Jesus spoke to people who were having a hard time believing he's even alive. They were talking to him. He's right there and they couldn't believe it. And look what he said to them. And we know it by heart a lot of us. Mark 16, 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that is believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. Any believers in the house tonight? today. Any believers here? Hallelujah. In my name they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they might recover. They'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Say they shall. They shall recover. This should be you. And this should be me. It's time to move from being saved to following Jesus. Stay saved or you can't follow Him. We must move from our first encounter with Jesus and as we follow Him, each of us will have a, another and another and another and another and another encounter with Him as we follow we keep having encounters with Jesus where He speaks to us and changes us and grows us and deals with us about our sin and sends His Holy Spirit to fill us to overflowing over. And you think when you first met Jesus, that's not the end. That's the beginning of refreshings and of encounters with Jesus. And as they followed, and as these 12 said, I just can't believe he's alive. He's sitting right here. Have you ever had to just reach out to touch? Just to be, are, you, I'm, I'm not, are you really here? <laughs> they saw him. But if you'd have seen him die, you'd have had trouble believing too. And I want you to let that sink in. He's speaking to 12 men who were having trouble believing. And he still said, go. Sometimes we preach the word and teach the word as if we have to be super spiritual to be used by God. And that simply is not the case. Even in those times when you struggle with believing, God says, go. That's what he said to them. Thank you, Lord. We must follow Jesus and listen, watch, learn, and do so that others can have their first encounter with him. Some people don't even know him yet. And I'm not talking about Africa. Africa, some of these foreign countries are having greater revivals than we are. I'm not talking about another country, another state. I'm talking about right here. As we follow Jesus, we do that so others can have their first encounter with Him. If we don't follow Him like we should, it may take a lot longer for some to have an encounter with Jesus. Do you believe that today? God's calling you to come to Him. He is. He's calling you right now. He's calling you to have an encounter with Him face to face this morning. Some of you are having an encounter with Jesus right where you are sitting at this moment. God's already been talking to you today. He's already been ministering to you. There's some set in here God's dealing with about changing our lifestyle, changing some things that need to be changed in us. God's speaking. You may not be shouting. You may not be running to the aisle but you know God's talking to you. God's talking to us today, isn't He? Hallelujah. 
Some of you have an encounter right now. You had it during worship and you're continuing to have it through this preaching today. Hear Jesus say, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you. Follow me, he says, and I'll make you what I want you to be. Follow me and I'll make you my son, my daughter. Follow me and I'll make you that fisher of men. So, what are you doing with Jesus? What are we doing with Jesus? just came up for the weekend to check out the area. There's nothing that can compare to it, that's for sure. Do you live around here? Yeah, I live and work downtown, when I'm not tromping through the mountains. Other than the trail, it's hard to believe anyone ever stepped foot up here. I know, it's so wonderful. Not at all like down in the city. Do you come up here a lot? Yep, every weekend. Sometimes after work, and I've even been known to come up early in the morning, just as the sun's about to rise. Really? That's amazing. You think so? Well, yeah. I don't know. I guess when you really love something, you just try to learn more about it. I've explored caves, climbed cliffs, discovered meadows, and there's still so much I don't know about these mountains. I've just scratched the surface. Whoa. Sounds like these mountains are kind of an obsession for you. I've never really thought about it like that, but I guess they are. I mean, when you reach the summit, just as the sun's beginning to rise, and you're greeted with the sight of a deer joining you and welcoming a new day, I guess it's hard to find a reason not to love it up here. Don't you have something that you love so much that you would do anything to learn more about? I suppose so. I don't know, I'd have to think about it. Well, like some people really love their pets or their cars or I don't know, church, I guess. And is there something wrong with it? Church? So you're a Christian? Yes, I am. Well, there you go. For me, communing with these mountains must be like you communing with Jesus, wanting to learn more about him. What do you mean? Well, like, I imagine you probably spend a lot of time in the Bible learning everything you can about Jesus. And you probably go to church every Sunday and Bible study once or twice a week. Am I right? Listen, you don't have to turn into a Jesus freak just to be a Christian. I never said you did. Hey, I'm sorry. Kelly. Kelly Griffin. I'm Paula Marsh. Nice to meet you, Paula. Yeah, it's nice to meet you too, Kelly. Sorry if I offended you. No, well, it's not you. I guess my conscience was bugging me. Really? Yeah. You talk about these mountains like they're your friends, like there's nothing you wouldn't do to get to know them better. Yeah. And then you talk to me about church. And Jesus is supposed to be the most important part of my life. And I don't know, I guess in comparison, I don't spend a lot of time getting to know him better. Well, Paula, I guess you just need to decide what's important to you. If it's not Jesus, you're more than welcome to join me up here on the mountain next weekend. There's so much I could show you. I want to thank you, Kelly. You've shown me more up here than I thought I'd ever see. So you'll be back next week. I'm sorry, Kelly. There's a little church near my home that I'm gonna visit next week. And a dusty Bible that needs more attention. And a little spot in my house that's waiting for me to pray again. So Mother Nature isn't enough? 
Oh, I love nature, and I will be back, but Mother Nature's gonna have to take a back seat to Father God. You've helped me see that there's a passion required in my relationship with Jesus. And I've been keeping him at a distance for far too long. Well, now I'm the one that's curious. Well, walk with me. I'll tell you all about him. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> what are you doing with Jesus? Not only what are you doing with Jesus, but what can he do for you today? What are you doing with him? And what can he do for you? Nature had to take a back seat. God began to speak to that girl. Is God speaking to anybody today besides me? If you're here today and you say, Pastor Bracken, you know what? I really do need to strengthen my commitment to God. Is there anybody bold enough to say, that's me? I'd be the first to step to the altar and say, I want to strengthen my walk with God, my commitment to Him. If there's others that want to do the same, I want you to step out from where you are.